four, three, two, one. I told you before to be careful where you put your legs. I was only trying to be helpful. I can help myself. What are you waiting for? Come on. Come on. What are you waiting for? Come on. Come on. For seven decades, Michael Keane has been among the world's most renowned and recognisable actors. It was just what I needed. A one-inch god with a two-inch penis. The star of classics like Zulu, The Man Who Will Be King and The Cider House Rules. It's a miracle no one was killed but also films that brought his career to the brink of complete implosion. I made a mistake. Somehow, he has always found a way back. You're a big man, but you're in bad shape. For me, it's a full-time job. In this epic podcast series, we will watch and review every Michael Caine movie, from the greatest hits... You're only supposed to blow the bloody doors off! ...to the incredible misses... You failed to maintain your weapon, son. And take a deep dive into the life and work of one of the world's most recognisable film stars. His name is Michael Caine, and no one will forget his name. To understand how he has made the mark of Caine. Well, you all settled in? Right, we can begin. For God's sake, come in! Hello and welcome to The Mark of Kane, our ongoing stagger through the maze of movies that is the filmography of Mighty Kane. Watching every single film, whether it's an absolute Kane classic or one of those Kane movies that just brings us down a dead end. My name is Michael Foley and I'm joined as always by Stephen Black of the Mallow News Twitter feed. Hey nonny no to you. And uh, hey nonny no to you. What prompted the nonny no's? I don't know, I just got a feel for it. I, I mean, I should have actually used the hey nonny no for the last valley, I think, you know. Science, 16th, 17th century sort of thing. You know, I just, I don't know. I don't know. It's just the mood took me. Why? Do you have an issue yeah, with any no? Yeah, maybe repress that emotion the next time <laughs> it bubbles up, yeah. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Well, you know what? You know what it could be as well? I kind of, I'm a bit conscious of being upbeat now for this one, right? Because I kind of felt like we finished the last episode on a low note. We were kind of You're talking a bit upbeat, even in the worst of circumstances. Even when you were doing that bloody Sunday documentary, the most comments were, Jiz, he seems fierce, happy about this. <laughs> He's very chipper about the whole thing. <laughs> like, I thought the last movie like we were we were it was people and we were teeing up harry and walter go to new york for today and i i kind of I was kind of talking down harry and walter before i even watched and i feel a little bit i feel a little bit bad about that now like it's not all i mean we've watched a lot of bad Kane movies but it's not all bad isn't it not all right but look i've been thinking about this i was trying to think what's the best way to kind of describe uh, and i think basically what it is is that we're in, we're now at this stage in a rather loveless marriage with michael Caine. <laughs> the pair of us are kind of this uh polygamous <laughs> Marriage uh, with Michael K- with McCain, and I think like last week with Peeper, it's pretty much yeah. This is what we've come to expect. Yeah, you know, just mm-hmm. does nothing new. You know, there's no affection, there's no expression of love or spontaneity. <laughs> uh, and this week, it's not uh, like a couple of weeks. A couple of weeks ago, we would have had the man who would be king, and that's like oh, he's remembered a birthday. Not only he's remembered a birthday, but he's pulled out all the stops, a slap up meal, Cumberland sausages. You know. Good quality, good quality food. <laughs> the beans, Heinz, none of your bachelor's nonsense. Do with the imports, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it, just the fact that he remembered it, that was enough. To, maybe you kind of looked at these eyes across across the, the kitchen table and went, yeah, there's probably something there. Yeah. Whereas this week, whereas this week, it's more, how would you put this? This is more like, you know, you've been invited to to go to dinner with a, with a group of friends and you said to them, you're not fucking drinking. Okay. You know what you're like? <laughs> you you're not drinking. You're like. All right. You know what you're no, like? No one and, gets more clever and, after drinks. So no, no. Brilliant. And you know what? You, this is always, gets, you know, it gets a bit leery. Just don't <laughs> like. So you go to dinner and <laughs> dinner is a disaster. It's a disaster because another couple at the table are squabbling and they're mm-hmm. airing all their dirty laundry in public. Talking over each other. Oh, talking everything. over each other. Yeah, yeah. The, f- the food is dreadful. It's yeah. a bad experience, but you can't blame him. He stayed off the drink. He's there yeah. nursing his, his, his fucking uh, pint of my wadi and he's behaving himself. So you mm-hmm. kind of go, fucking either like, that was shit, but it wasn't your fault. So similarly, when Harry and Walter uh, go to New York, it's shit. But he's behaved himself. He's done perfectly well in it. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's you know, and it's not his fault. But overall, this was an awful experience. <laughs> yeah, he, he is the best thing about a bad dinner party in this. By a mile, he's the best thing in yeah. this film. Which I, is I think of, pretty much in the same way. If you go for a, if you go for a kind of what does it go for a colonoscopy? Apparently, the drugs for that are great. But ultimately, it's not an experience that anybody wants to go through. 
yeah, it's still a tube up your arse at the end of the day. It really is at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. So, well, on that, on, on that cheery, on that cheery and very tasteful note, uh, after we had, as we said, we had the noirish sort of stylings of 1940s LA with Peeper. We're winding the clock back a little bit further this time now with Kane. He's a celebrity bank robber alongside some 70s movie royalty in this one. Elliot Gould, James Caan, Diane Keaton, and they're all together from a comedy heist movie that's set in the 1890s. Are you still with us? Called Harry and Walter Go to New York. Columbia Pictures takes you back to the elegance, the glamour, the fun of New York City at the turn of the century. Meet Harry Digby. He wants to be the ultimate con man and travel with high society. He's got charm, he's got confidence, he's got Walter. After we bust that bank, we're gonna be eating lunch here for the rest of our lives. Walter Hill. He just wants to break into show business. The theater, Harry, you know? All right, I But ever since he teamed up with Harry, yeah. he's been going places, such as prison, where they meet Adam Worth. Smooth, suave, good morning, good morning. sophisticated, and treated like royalty behind bars. How many safes have you blown? Well, obviously one too many. I wouldn't be here, would I? Well, I suppose they do go to New York, but they it's actually to Massachusetts they go to rob a bank. But anyway, that's not important right now. How is it for you? How was it for me? Mm-hmm. Do you want me to go back to the colonoscopy? Uh, oh, yeah. That's right. I, I, analogy, I, 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 I actually erased that from my brain there briefly. Yeah, yeah it wasn't. It's not. Um, it's not it's great. a bit of a mess, isn't it? And it opens up promisingly enough. There's the, it yeah. opens with the two the two boys, uh, James Cannon and Lee Gould, uh, are the eponymous Harry and Walter, not mm-hmm. the eponymous New York, because that would be quite the stretch, I guess. Uh <laughs> Uh, in a, they're a, a vaudeville double act, a pair of uh, low low rent con men, and they they do a song and dance number, which is perfectly okay. Um, it well, I can make out from going through previous interviews with Elliot Gould, like, and I have found one where he talked about it. He seems to think they did a great job. I thought it was a wonderful experience. And this is an interview back in the nineties, I think it was. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. where he, ref- he just points the interview over to a post that he has with the original po- uh, poster framed in his wall, and how they they practice for months to get the routine right. You're gonna go. That's fine, but mm-hmm. there's other parts of the movie where you needed to sing and dance, and it's a fucking atrocious. <laughs> this is the thing about this film. The first twenty minutes are 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 good, and you're going. This is going to be good, as you said. I mean, it's it's something to see James Can, you know, this kind of alpha male actor, um, doing a song and dance number with Elliot Gould. It's very good. Kane comes in as a celebrity bank robber. He's terrific. He's terrific, like, and you're kind of going, and it, this, this might start. I think right. this is the debut, the debut of, of Kane's shit-eating grin. You know, this right. big, I, I'm a villain, uh, mm-hmm. I'm a comedic villain, shit-eating grin that he kind of see throughout his career, like in the likes of Dirty <laughs> Rotten Scoundrels. It's his, it's his debut. It's the launch. It is of the uh, SEG. Yeah, and, and it it's, is, it's a marvel to behold. It is magnificent, and it is absolutely. We spoke very briefly about Dirty Rotten Scoundrels for the Last Valley, actually, uh, when he did his German accent in inverted commas, yeah. um, as kind of saying, yes, this was the first the first kind of sighting of Dr. Emil Schofhausen. Well, this is the first sighting in this film of Lawrence Jemison, the character he plays in Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. It is to a T. It's like, it's like a practice sketch for the, for, the, for the character that he will nail in whatever, about 12 years, 1976, whatever. Yeah, so 11, 12 years time. He's going to nail it, like. But... Um, yeah, he's he's actually yeah, the first twenty odd minutes are excellent. It's interesting you say that Elliot Gould thought it was great because apparently James Can and Elliot Gould during the whole process thought they were being hilarious. They thought this was going to be great. But then it's funny how these things go. Movie comes out, no one likes it, and James Can just starts walking away, and everybody starts walking away from this movie at a rate of knots. Uh I mentioned yeah, Billy, Billy Wild Billy Wilder uh, used to say that the more fun you have making a comedy the less funny it's going to end up being. He said, you shouldn't be having any fun making it. Mm. Uh, it sh- all the, the the comedy should be in the end product. Um, well, and I think you can see that with an awful, you'd see an awful lot, this is an awful lot in common with the more, I guess, the more extreme versions of the, of the kind of Will Ferrell uh, movies that he did after Anchorman, the, the, the fucking NASCAR movie, mm-hmm. uh, the dangerous road rage of Rodney Carfield or whatever the fuck it's called. <laughs> uh, 
and that <laughs> walk hard one that everyone seems to love, which is fucking awful. And also Step Brothers, which I'm sorry, is fucking ah, step appalling. Brothers, right. step it's brothers terrible. Is I also hate John. C- I hate John C. Reilly. Catalina Wine chronic- mixed away. I chronically unfunny. I find him chronically unfunny. Oh, okay. I like him as a dramatic actor, but it's like somebody told, it's like what you actually, a lot of common, curly, which you can, curly hair, extremely unfunny. Uh, but it's it's like, you've let this, the egos run rampant, loads of improvisation done on set, everybody's having a great time, think, oh, it's a great line, try this one, try this one. And then the, what you end up at the end is this bloated, amorphous, unfunny fucking lump that mm. nobody thinks is funny. Because is- the structure has gone out of the movie, all of this is just all it is is just it's it's just a mess well it is absolutely whatever about the other ones you mentioned this is absolutely the case here and i mean it's an there's an interesting story kane tells in one of his in one of his books uh as we know as we know since his early career kane stopped washing wa- <laughs> washing washing the rushes stopped washing he stopped he stopped washing uh he stopped watching the rushes uh because he just wanted to he just didn't feel it felt it, it actually affected him so again in this case he didn't watch the rushes and neither did diane keaton so when the rushes were, were being shown or whatever, Can and Gould would be inside watching them. Kane and Keaton would generally sit outside the room if they did at all. And they'd just be listening for laughs and see what's anybody. So they would hear laughter and then people would, would kind of stumble out of the room, kind of howling and people in tears laughing. Yeah, but you don't want them. You've got two fucking massive egos there. Well, that's what it was. That's what exactly what it You're, was. It's, not a te- it's the test audience you want to hear howling and exactly. fucking laughter. Not the well, two lads who are so materially involved in the movie like they're not like Elliot Gould is a good uh, comedic uh, dramatic actor he's got great chops in it but this this there is no chemistry between him and Jim, uh, Jim no. and Jimmy Khan in this movie no chemistry they're two the characters they play are two morons mm-hmm. there are no traits that they display of any uh, inherent skill they're pretty poor vaudevillians they're terrible uh, uh, scam artists and they kind of stumble from one seat to, to another and it's okay to have two idiot leads you look at something like dumb and dumber yeah again two idiot leads uh but they're funny the material that they, they, they they're given is funny mm-hmm. this is not again the, no. what they're given the dialogue is dreadful it's leaden it and the, the way it's delivered is with all the finesse of a f- fucking anvil yeah. it's it's no good. McCain does the absolute. McCain and Diane Keaton do the absolute best with the material they're given. McCain steals the show every time he's on screen. Diane yep. Keaton has a couple of a couple of good uh, scene stealing speeches, mm-hmm. but again, she's not meant to be funny in it. She's meant to be kind of dramatic and you know. Yeah, she's a campaigning rousing. newspaper editor. Yeah, but she but she does she does that superb. You can see all the quality that you see in the, in the, yeah. in the Woody Allen films of that era when she was in. A, you, yeah. can, you know, she's bringing that. Yeah. She's just good. She's very good. Yeah. But like, yeah, look, it's just, as you say, it's two rampaging egos. E- as you say, it's two rampaging egos kind of bouncing off yeah, each other. Egos, 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 yeah, egos, yeah, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm having a blinder today. Come here, will I just get into the plot and we can circle back around to Kane and Kane and Gould and Can in a second? I guess, yeah. I, yeah. Just, I, 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 I shudder <laughs> having to listen to the fucking plot again after watching it. Well, the, you, let's just about it. If you haven't, it, 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 to, to Paddy, the listener here. Uh, yeah. Paddy, if you've, if you've watched this, you're aware that this is almost two hours long. Mm-hmm. 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 It's, it's, it's a hell of a, it's a doozy. And I mean, you can see in some of the edits, by the way, pretty early in the film, the editing is, is terrible. You can see they've actually cut it back from, from something much longer. But the, even, the, even the way they've done that has screwed up the film, you know? But anyway, on to the plot, right? Very quickly, everybody. Uh, so, Harry, played by James Cannon, Walter, Eric Gould, are basically a vaudevillian variety act who hustle a few bucks on the side, robbing their audience and whatnot. They get sent to jail, uh, where they work as servants to Kane's character, Adam Worth, a cultured, famous bank robber. He's full of charm. Ladies love him. He's on the newspapers at the time, everything. Worth wants to rob this apparently impregnable bank in Lowell in Massachusetts to get one over on his bank manager, who who essentially got him put away in, in, initially. Uh, so he gets plans secretly drawn up at the bank, but they get accidentally destroyed by Harry and Walter while taking a photograph of these plans as Worth is being interviewed by Diane Keaton's character, Lisa Chestnut, what a lovely name. She's this campaigning newspaper editor. So she takes pity on the lads when Kane loses a rag at them. And after they break out of jail, they hook up with her. So Worth is also released around the same time. So now it's a race basically to rob the bank, right? So Harry, Walter, and this kind of group of radical newspaper people on one side and Adam Worth on the other. They overhear his plans at some stage to rob the bank and they mirror exactly the same plans. So they tunnel, they're tunnel, they tunneling in from a theatre next door to the bank 
uh, where there's like a comedy opera on uh, just before Worth arrives to use the same tunnel. But they have to stall the play next door to detain Worth and blow up the safe, whatever. So Harry and Walter go back, get on stage, generally act the maggot, which buys just enough time for their team to blow the safe, get away with the cash. Kane's group go down the tunnel only to meet the cops who can't arrest them because they haven't actually done anything. So Harry and Walter, so, you know, yay, Harry and Walter got the money for. So Harry and Walter and the rest arrive at this fancy restaurant days later that's frequented pretty much exclusively, it seems, by the hoi polloi of the bank robbing world. And everybody sees him and the reception is very, very cold until Worth Kane's character stands up and taps his glass as a sign of respect. And the next thing they're greeted as heroes and Kane gets the girl, bizarrely, Diane Keaton. The lads stand up and do their awful vaudevillian routine. And that's, and that's pretty much it. It's, it's baggy. It's a bit messy. As Stephen, like you said, every time Kane's on screen, he steals the entire show. He's the adult in the room. Every time he's on, because you've got these other two idiots um, mugging and standing in front of each other and talking over each other and trying to outdo each other at every turn. And they think they think it's 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 a double act. This is this is what a double act is. But as we know, I think anyway, as we know from watching uh, The Man Who Will Be King. I mean, Kane and Connery showed precisely how double acts should work and how you give each other space and room to manoeuvre and actually enhance each other's performance in that way. These guys are just standing all over each yeah, other. Yeah, they have no interest in making each other better in this or giving no. each other space to, to, to you know, act. Yeah, <laughs> you basically, know? yeah. That's it. This is basically a rip-off rip of the sting, though, really. Yeah. It's, it's at the same era. It's like three years after the fact. Kane is, I guess, is the Robert Shaw character in this. But... Like the, I mean, in the in the Sting, uh, Newman and Redford's characters are clever. Mm -hmm. They're professional con artists. They're just a pair of morons who basically fall from scene to scene, gurning uh, at the camera um, and delivering terrible lines. And yeah. the, like the the comedy, so it's supposed to be it's a built as a comedy heist movie. So it's not it's not funny. And the heist itself is shoehorned into the unfunniest part of the the end of the movie as the two lads delay or uh, delay. Michael like Caine's character's uh, arrival to the vault by you know, making sure that the, the show goes on longer than necessary. And that's just tedious and oh, painful. Terrible. Eddie Gould blacks up to play oh, a more... That's the low point, actually, isn't it, of the whole thing? When just, Eddie Gould comes just, out blacked up. You've got Commandant Lassard, who apparently was born at the age of 72, <laughs> uh, there as well. And the heist is just... The heist itself is terrible it's without it's so long any it's not complex it's not even co complicated and it's not you know it's not it's, there's no finesse to it you know yeah. you know, like even though some, like oceans 11 the way that something is carried out you know it's it's part of a, the 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 enjoyment of a heist movie is how you know intricate the plans are and how those plans adapt to the inevitable uh oh something goes awry and now we have to improvise in the moment and make the best of it that's the the enjoyment that you get out of a heist movie there's not no element to this here no, and community, nothing. just out of interest, um, mm. are in your office, are there a bunch of uh, professional, like, do reporters generally have uh, professional uh, thievery skills, like the, the, oh, yeah. the well, newspaper office here? Yeah. You better, you, so they, you, they, you they, better they believe they it. They, the, like Diane Keaton's team uh, on, on her uh, community newspaper turn their hands to crime with surprising alacrity. Like, so I assume that's the same for you when you go to work every week. It's like, lads, will it be this week? No, you know, it's obviously journalism isn't paying what it once what it once did. I think, unless you're David Davenport, I I, I understand uh, you're probably only you're probably you're probably only earning about uh, maybe five hundred k after taxes. I am literally always a week away from robbing the first mutual trust. I literally yeah. a week all the time, and one of these days I will. But now I'm after giving the game away. Maybe I'll have I'll have if to you, rob the second thinking, mutual trust. Thinking, oh, no, naming names, no. Would you if you go into the office? Uh, well, whenever it is that you go into the office um, in person. You look at the people around you. Could you say there's enough competent? Would you say there's enough competent people in your office to carry out a heist of this uh, level of complexity? Could they even rob a spar? <laughs> they can barely get a newspaper out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which I tell you what is a hell of a lot more complex than a bank job. Certainly, certainly judging by this particular bank job, it is. Is it not all automated? No, is it? Not? It's, it's all automated. automated. <laughs> who the fuck are you fo Who the fuck are you fooling? <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, I need an article. Press Google. Yeah. Google. Google. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's cutting. You can get spell check. All done. It's, Make up a few quotes. Yeah. Bish bash. Oh, yeah. you go with your newspaper, like. Yeah, yeah. The hackathon two thousand. You know, 
just yeah. press a button, off you go. You know, it's on. I know, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm not even going to. I'm not even going to pretend it's difficult anymore. But it's definitely, it's definitely harder than a bank heist on the basis of this particular movie. It's so drawn out that freaking bank heist. It goes on forever. Can I pick two? There, like, there's just two. And I know we should be here talking about Kane, but I mean, the, the thing about it is, he's not really. He's not the main, he's, the, he's the main man when he's on screen in this because he's just yes. so much better than everybody else. But he's not really yep. the main man in the film, so we won't yep. we, we won't dwell too long on this. But like, there are two things I just want to two scenes that I think kind of nail nail Can and Gould. Like, there's an awful Laurel and Hardy bit that they do. They're trying to break into an office in the dead of night, and they start at each other outside, like you're know, tweaking their nose and hitting each other with each other's hats and all this kind of stuff. And it's like you can see you you're watching it going, oh, this is the boys now, kind of doing you know doing their homage. And showing that they can, you know, match it. They, they can stand toe to toe with the greatest comedians of our time. And you're like, going, lads, it's, it's actually embarrassingly bad. It's it's awful. And then the la- like the 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 other, the other thing that really kind of brings the whole thing together is that scene at the end when they're in this fancy restaurant and they decide this is the best house we're ever going to play, and they they do their vaudeville act, and it ends up the actual film ends up with Gould and Can staring down the lens of the camera at the end of their lovely song and dance routine, as though to say, weren't we just the stars of this? And you're looking at it going, no, actually, you're the lads who completely made a complete bollocks of it for everybody else. Like, there is a decent film in here, you know, screaming to get out, but it never, it never had a hope with these two in it. Uh, what is the director's to blame here? So it's Mark Rydell, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Uh, who, who starred with Kane in The Long Goodbye. And clearly he's, he's, he, he is a friendly, or at least uh, with with Ellie Gould. There's no attempt to rein them in and kind of keep the the show on the yeah, road here. It's very good like friends with James Can actually. Very good friends yeah. with James Can and, and was very, very much there for Can. I think when he went through his uh, his drink and drugs hell, Mark Rydell was and one the, of the people who helped him out of it. Yeah, and the the writer as well ended up what the he uh, the same guy who directed The Razor's Edge, which was. I think a film that was responsible for Bill Murray taking some time out in terms of where he thought his life was going, um, <laughs> and he also he also wrote du- duets, right? Which was uh, infamously oh. one of the worst one of the worst movies of all time, with Gwyneth mm-hmm. Paltrow and Huey Lewis in the news from uh, <laughs> Huey Lewis in the news man. <laughs> yeah, like I mean the, the list when you when you when you do a little bit of research on this, the list of people who who just like. Disavow it. Disavow it and say it actually nearly yeah. ruined my career. So Mark Rydell himself yeah. said he, he was quoted saying, you know, I, I'm slightly paraphrasing here, but he said everything was uphill after Harry and Walter. He couldn't he couldn't get a job. Uh, Leslie Ann Warren, who's in this film, said she struggled to get work after Harry and Walter. Um, Tony Bill, the producer, said it's the one movie, I'm quoting him here now, the one movie of which I'm ashamed because it was not my taste. It was a wonderful script. Yeah, right. Completely rewritten by the director. The writer, Robert Kaufman, he says, he said, I got married again. I finished five years of analysis. I stopped hating. Even though it's against my nature, I wrote a funny big piece of lemon meringue pie. But nobody wants to go see a funny, optimistic picture. I think they do, actually. I think I think just I think they do. But just not this one. No, it's just not neither this funny one, nor optimistic, to be honest with you. Um, Mark Riddell, Mark Riddell directed on Golden Pond. Yeah. Which, you know, it's essentially is like fucking like the, the 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 greatest visual representation of why a trip to Dignitas would is a good idea. <laughs> See fucking Fonda and Hepburn. Oh, oh. just kind of meandering around the screen. <laughs> Do you know what? As well, actually, just look at as, the pond. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. gold. Just to get you away it's from gold. The... It ain't it. Oh, yeah. It sure is. Why don't we go on this golden pond? Just two hours just, that shit. Just to steer the just to steer the conversation a little bit away from euthanasia. Um what struck me as well. Like, oh, this, you always want to steer the conversation. I really away from do. I'm, I'm getting up to that age now. I, I don't need to be even thinking about the options. Um the n- amount of talent in this film, right? So obviously we have got we've got like what I, as I said at the top, our 70s box office royalty straight off the top, which you also have you have Charles Durning, Dog Day Afternoon Ooh. and the Sting. Charles Durning. Ooh. Sorry, you pronounced Charles very, very... Oh, did I? Sorry, sorry. Charles. I'm having a great day of it here. I have to say Joes <laughs> and Charles and all sorts. Right, okay. Charles Durning from Dog the Afternoon Sting. Leslie Arn Warren, I mentioned there, she was in Clue. Val Avery from The Magnificent Seven. You have David Proval. I think it's Proval. He was in Mean Streets. He's in Shawshank. He was in Sopranos. He's in Everybody Loves Raymond. Um, you have Burt Young from Rocky in Chinatown. Boy, hey, buddy. You got Jack Guilford from Cocoon. You mentioned Commandant Lassard from Police Academy. 
Ted Carol Cassidy. Kane. Carol, Carol Kane. Kane. Carol Kane. Carol Kane. Woefully Kane. underused. One of, the, one of the greatest fucking comedic actresses of all time, given like I think about two or three lines of this movie. Oh, it's just, I mean, again, it's just like this movie could have been, it really, I think it really could have been really, really great. And I yep. mean, you know, and Kane doesn't need to do any more than what he's done. I mean, this is, this is the most lavish cast, I I think anyway, so far for Kane. Um, and he, he outshines them all. He beats them all up a stick, um, which says something about him, but more about the script and the, and the rest of them. Reviews are fairly mixed at the time. It's funny looking back at some of these films that now look like absolute skack. Some of the move, some some of the reviews can actually be bizarrely positive for someone, but in this case, it's kind of a mix. They just say ah, it's a bit of a mess. Pretty much what we're saying, it's a bit of a mess. Kane's the best thing about it. Kane, Kane and Ghoul are just way over the top. It's a bit of a letdown. It's not funny, and that's pretty much the long and the short of it, really, as far as the critics were concerned at the time. Yep. Originally, can you believe this? How would you think this would work? Right. Originally, they wanted Jack Nicholson in this film in one of the lead roles, like. Does that even work? Would that have worked? Would that have helped? This is a trying to think about Jack Nicholson's forays into comedy through the in something like this slapstick. No, very much not Jack Nicholson's uh, wheelos. I think it would have probably done the same thing to his career that it did to Jim, uh, Jimmy Cans. Jimmy Cans. So even in that sense, like even 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 their kind of number one choices were bad choices. You know, they yeah. just this yeah. is never getting off the ground. It's interesting little kind of thing. Like Can and Gould are going to appear in another Kane movie in a couple of movies time a bridge too far I I know like a lot of things with a bridge too far they're not I don't think they're on the screen at any time with Kane but they're there he also our man replaced James Kane for the Holcroft Covenant in the 80s Kane was meant to do the Holcroft Covenant it's another classic that he knocked back I I think yeah to be fair that might be one of the few instances where James Kane made the right choice it's incredible isn't it like he knocked back Superman Apocalypse No Kramer vs Kramer and One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest who is he playing in Superman Um, Superman I don't know. Do I know that Brando, a dwarf, a dwarf of Superman was it? I'm not sure. I couldn't be 100 because of the gravity. Sure. I think it was Superman. I think it was Superman. I came across it. I came across an interview with him on, on Howard Stern from many, many, many years ago, where he 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 uh, he confirmed he had knocked back Superman. Apparently, Brando was mad keen to get him involved, but no, he wasn't. He wasn't for uh, he wasn't for taking it on, you know. And then Apocalypse Now, who's like what, like that long in the Philippines? I don't think so. He must have spoke to he, he must have spoke to our man about too late to hear. I'd say maybe. Just, no, no, no Philippines. Anyway, moving swiftly along. Marks for Kane. I mean, look, again, we're not marking the movie. It's the performance here. What would you give him for this? I'll give him a seven. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's a very well-deserved seven for our man on this one. Good, solid performance. Hinting at better things to come, as we say. I mean, this is this is, this is is the template for Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, really. And what are the better things to come in terms of the next movie, Michael? Well, let, let me tell you, Stephen, for our next movie, we're moving slightly backwards in the timeline from Harry and Walter, but dramatically forward in real Kane times. Yep, not confusing. From 1976 now, we're jumping to 1992. And you know why? Because right now, as we record these episodes, Christmas is a coming. And what would any Kane Christmas be without a Muppets Christmas Carol? Hello. <laughs> The Muppet Christmas Carol. I'll drink to Mr. Scrooge, even though he is odious, <laughs> stingy, <laughs> and badly dressed. Humbug. Oh, there goes Mr. Humbug. There goes Mr. Grin. Oh, I thought I was going to be blaming on real. I watched it for <laughs> no reason. <laughs> Apparently, that's the one everybody wants to hear. But you're getting them up as Christmas Carol, and you'll be glad of it. Be so happy. Happy freaking Christmas. Here's a Muppet Christmas Carol. Really? And you'll enjoy really? it. I- I'll tell you what, Michael, after watching two Muppets cavort about a stage in this in this movie, you know, I can't wait to go and so on, you know. Where uh, I'm yes, going. yes, yes, yes. Yeah, and we yeah. will now get to see proper, proper Muppets. Yes, we're, we're yeah. breaking with our policy of slavishly watching every movie in order to break out the good feels. Which apparently this is a modern Christmas cinema classic. I, I've never seen it. Have you seen it? I, I, never I, have, I haven't it. seen it. I haven't seen it because when it came out, I wouldn't have been watching movies like that. In 1992, I was more concerned with watching movies that might have a might have a hint of titten in them. To be quite honest, <laughs> with you. and as far as I know, Miss Piggy keeps it all on in this one. So. Yes, she does. Wondering. Yes, she does. Yes, she does. And there are there are there are no attendant tits either in the film. To be fair, everyone's yeah, on we, top we have to, We'll have to leave forward. We'll have to leave forward to uh, a, a Muppet Fifty Shades of Grey, which I think again is Kane's finest, allegedly Kane's finest performance. Oh, the mind boggles! Oh, I have, I have unconventional desires. <laughs> 
<laughs> poor Rizzo. Poor Rizzo has to make a run for it at some point in Muppets Fifty Shades of Grey. Come here to me. Come here. Come here. Oh my God. This isn't where I thought this was going to go. This is, this is lovely. It's going to be Christmas. Good feels. It's going to be lovely. It's going to be great. Muppets Christmas yeah. Carol. Yay. I feel this is probably one of those things that uh, millennials are probably uh, hyped about. This is this is gives me all the feel. This hits me right in the feels. This movie is fire, and on and on and on with those kind of yes, things. Yes, yes. About a old movie they probably haven't seen in years, and it probably reminds them of a time when, you know, they were safe in a, in a house that they that they didn't have to pay rent for, and weren't sharing it with fifteen other uh, Brazilian delivery drivers. Oh, lovely! And he's off on his Christmas rent. There we go. Well, that's that's a lovely, that's a chilling vision of my Christmas drinks to come. Stevens millennial rent. Love. I have nothing against millennials. God love them. They, they, they. I don't know how they manage to get through every day of their existence. It must be miserable. Zero hour contracts and such. I don't actually oh, know that God. much about them. So uh, they use the internet. I understand. Apparently so. Apparently. Well, good luck to them. I say. Ooh. Good luck to them. And I'm, I'm not allowing you Ooh. humbug your way into Anti- this. Pro no. ra- uh, anti-racism is all. What's that about? Come oh, on. I don't get that at all. I don't understand that. Anyway, I'm not allowing your humbug. Cancel culture. Cancel culture. <laughs> Ooh. I'm not humbug. I'm not humbug. Allow, no 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 sorry no I'm not allowing your humbuggery to get in the way of this don't 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 reflect on the notion of the word humbuggery can I just ask you just I is, humbu- every- is, humbu- is humbuggery what a Tory politician uh, does in a, in a Soho basement yeah basically he's, exactly he's singing to himself it. yeah there you have it <laughs> 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 That's oh, it. God. Mm, 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 mm. oh god. Okay, 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 okay. Thank you. I don't think they go I, I don't think they get that far anyway. Um I think I think um if we want to pinpoint the moment where this podcast just went through the floor, I think we've just nailed it. Now, and I I can't believe we've gone so far from Harry and Walter and even further away again now from the good feels of of Muppet's Christmas Carol down to like a, a basement and a Tory politician humbuggering away um, while homing his national anthem. That's just, I don't know what, I just don't, I don't actually know what's just happened. So I'm just going to ask people to come back the next day. Absolutely go find this movie in the next week and we will, del- we will just dive so happily into this film. It's a role, Kane, a Scrooge, he plays as straight as a die. The Muppets like may well have been De Niro the way he attacks this one. And we know, Stephen, that invested cane is good cane. Absolutely. And don't forget, people, if you just, if you at uh, 23 minutes, 43 seconds, if you pause it just right, you can see Kermit's tiny Tim. OK, let's just leave it there. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in for Harry and Walter. I'm so looking forward to the next episode. As usual, like and subscribe. Like and subscribe on the platform of your choice. Follow us on Twitter. Ask us questions on Twitter, no matter how personal. Actually, even more personal, the better. And yeah. uh, we will see you again next week. Bye. Bye. That's it for this week's episode. Thanks for listening. Make sure to like and subscribe. Um, Maybe leave a comment. Only nice ones, though. Mean comments will make Alfie cry, and no one wants to see that. The Marco Kane podcast is written, researched, and presented by Stephen Black and Michael Foley, and edited by Andrew Foley. Music is composed by Stephen Black. If you'd like to get in touch, you'll find us on Twitter at at Mallow News and at Marco Kane 2. And if you enjoyed this episode, you'll find all the rest wherever you get your podcasts. Mark of Kane is a Mallow News Two Cubes production. See you next time.